Um, while we're getting this started, I just wanted to say that I prepared this very quickly, and I have very bad jet lag, so anything could happen. <laughs> First of all, who here has been to Vancouver? A very, yeah, you don't count. <laughs> One. Perfect, I can make everything up, you won't know. <laughs> all right. There we go. Oops. All right. We're going to talk tonight about why Vancouver is a livable city. Part of it is about context. We are in a beautiful place. And part of it is about policies. So one of the context issues is that we are here on the west coast of Canada. We have a very large island to the west of us, which protects our waters. We have mountains to the north. We have agricultural land. Actually, I'm just going to check which button I use for the laser. Ah, it's not working. Agricultural land, farmland to the east, and the U.S. border to the south. So we cannot sprawl. Here we are again. This is uh, slightly off-center. Vancouver's actually over here. But there's the U.S. border. There are the mountains and the farmland and the ocean. So when we grow, we grow up. We also have three ski hills right north of the city. You can take a city bus to go skiing. Here's the city of Vancouver. We are part of a larger region. The city itself has about 630,000 people in it, much, much smaller than Moscow. But we are the largest, second largest city in the Pacific Northwest, just behind Seattle. Today I'll be talking about several things in the city, and I just want to point out right now, uh, I can't make this work. Right here where it says Yale Town, I'll be talking about that area of the city later in the presentation. So policies. What policies make us a livable city? Back in the 1960s, the city stopped the freeway that was going to come through the middle of the city. There is no freeway in the city of Vancouver. So if you were to get on the I-5 freeway in Mexico, drive straight north through California, through Oregon, through Washington State, you would never see a traffic light until you get to the border of Vancouver, where it becomes a city street. This has had a profound impact on the development of the city. In the 19, uh, er, rather in 2006, a new policy came in saying, we are going to encourage people to move downtown, to live downtown so they don't commute to work and then go back to the suburbs at night. And this is the result. A great deal of these buildings are actually apartment buildings. This is all residential. That's all residential. And in the middle are the offices. And that has profoundly changed also the way the city has grown. And the result is a kind of building called Podium Tower. You probably all know the Podium Tower buildings. And the reason we build our buildings this way, with, a, with a, a broad bottom and a skinny tower, is so we don't block the views to the mountains. We have protected view corridors throughout the entire city. There are uh, dozens of them, where if you stand at a certain point, you're not allowed to build a building that blocks your view of the ocean or of the mountains. So we build skinny, tall buildings. The podiums, the bottom part, used to be two or three stories. As we're becoming denser, they're up to seven to eight stories. And the towers are now up to 60 plus stories, over 60 stories on the top. Vancouver started to really become prominent on the international scene in 1986 when we had Expo. The city began to really become noticed and many people said, this is a pretty nice place, I think I'll move there. It was kind of like puberty for the city, just starting to grow up. In 2010, we had the Winter Olympics, which will be in Sochi in 2014. Uh, this was like we finally got old enough to move out of our parents' basement and become grown-ups all by ourselves. It was great. It was more fun than anything you could imagine. And now we are branding ourselves as the greenest city. This has been a very, very powerful brand for us. Again, we became known through Expo. We became very, very popular through the Olympics, and now we have this very powerful brand, the greenest city. 
And it's one of the things that makes us a very livable city. So I'm going to go through some of the major policy areas of the greenest city and talk about why that helps us be livable. The green economy. So we want to double the number of green jobs in the city, and we define the green jobs as jobs that are in green technology or in clean technology, digital media, also jobs that directly help the uh, ecology such as um, urban agriculture. And we very actively recruit companies that have green jobs in them. So we seek them out, we invite them to come visit us. The mayor goes to other cities, recruits companies. And after the Olympics, we saw over $60 million of new investment in green jobs within six months of the Olympics. Climate leadership. We have very aggressive programs to reduce our greenhouse gases. I'm going to go to my notes here. Green buildings. We are rewriting our building code right now, and we require uh, all buildings over a certain size to be at least lead platinum now, and we're getting to net zero buildings as well. Transportation is a very big part of what makes us a livable city. We talked today uh, in our jury a lot about transportation and cars and transit, Moscow is very good with 85% of your commuters using transit. We're not there yet. Right now we're at about 44% are using either bicycles or pedestrians or transit, and we want to get higher than that. We're better than most in North America. We do want to reduce our solid waste as well. Whoops, there we are, solid waste. And uh, we're very aggressive goals here as well. We're reducing the amount of garbage that's created all the time, and we're diverting it to recycling, to organic programs, and through programs that reduce the amount of packaging at the source. Access to nature. This is a very livable thing. So we are surrounded by nature, and you can take, as I say, a city bus and find yourself deep into the mountains very quickly. In fact, uh, the search and rescue organization that's on the north shore of Vancouver is one of the most active ones in the world because people go out into the mountains and get lost all the time. <laughs> and we have bears. Bears wander into backyards all the time. Two bears were shot in one of the suburbs just last week because they were uh, habitual garbage eaters. Right now, 93% of the residents live within a five minute walk to a green space and we've already planted 10,000 new trees. Food, we love food, we're a city of foodies. So what are food assets? They're community gardens, urban agriculture, uh, farmers markets, very, very popular, growing every year, and we're soon gonna have an urban food hub where people can um, can their food, they can store food, they can uh, prepare food for food carts, and uh, it, a, a very central place for the farmers markets as well. Clean water. We live in a place with lots and lots of clean water. It not only rains a lot, but we have the mountains and the snow, and uh, that melts down into our city's reservoirs. We actually have extremely clean drinking water. Uh, the, the, the federal government requires us to filter it anyway, which was a waste of money because it was clean anyway. Bad, that was a bad policy from the federal government. Clean air. We have very clean air in the city of Vancouver partly because the wind comes off of the ocean and blows it to where, uh, to where Gaetan lives, which he'll speak later. So it just blows out of the city right away. But we also uh, uh, tend to have quite clean running cars and, uh, and good practices for clean air. So we have great air quality. We work with our developers. As I said, we require them to build very green buildings. We give them quicker timelines if they build green buildings. And what's happening now is that developers are fighting to be seen as green developers. They like that greenest city branding and it's helping them sell the building if it's a greener building. The value goes up. I like this slide. Green infrastructure. So what does that mean? One of our favorite stories, bike lanes. We started putting in fully separated bike lanes a couple of years ago and cycling has gone up significantly. One of the ways that we measure the success of bike lanes is how many women and children are cycling. 
I don't like that measure. I biked anyway, but it's a, it's a worldwide uh, indicator of people feeling safe on their bicycles. So we've actually gone up from 30% women and children on our bike routes to 41% since putting in separated lanes. We're just getting started on this program. We've got a long way to go. But we're taking space away from cars. We're not building any new roads. We're taking space away from the cars, from parking, and from moving, and giving it back to cyclists. We have a seawall. A seawall goes around tens of kilometers of the city in a continuous path. It is one of the most popular recreation activities in the city is to walk or to bike on the seawall. Very, very crowded on a warm summer day. We have drinking water stations. We've been putting in more of these around the city. When I first got elected in 2002, all the drinking fountains were shut down because they were seen to be a waste of, of uh, money. We're opening them all back up again now. As I mentioned, we're reducing our garbage, and we're doing it uh, largely through diverting it to other places, such as an organic compost facility. We actually started this compost facility in uh, May. We've already diverted over 1,500 tons of organic waste. Our goal is uh, 25,000 tons of waste a year diverted from the landfill because of the organics program. We have neighborhood energy utilities. So this is a utility which is in the neighborhood that I pointed out at the beginning, and I'll, I'll say more about it in a few minutes, called Southeast Falls Creek or the Olympic Village. It's where the Olympic athletes lived. This is, a, this is not only a, a place where the vapor fumes, which is just water vapor, escape from this neighborhood energy utility, but the color on the tips of this, uh, which by the way, looks like the fingertips, that's tells you whether or not it's actually saving energy or not, or whether it's producing extra energy that goes back onto the grid. The source of the energy here, which heats an entire neighborhood of over 12,000 people, is one massive sewer pipe. <laughs> so we extract all the heat out of the mother of all sewage pipes, which goes underneath this neighborhood. We don't tell everybody that when they move in. We have charging stations. We're encouraging electric vehicles, but they don't work if you can't charge them. We're also supporting social enterprise. And for me, this is a really big, important part of what makes us a livable city. So here's a social enterprise called Soul Food. This is a, this is a uh, food producer, obviously. It's on an abandoned parking lot, which is a future development site. The developer is waiting for the economics to work to build the next tower here. They've already built 20 towers. And while they're waiting, we are using the land to grow vegetables, and this is employing people who are very, very difficult to employ. It's not a charity, it's a social enterprise. They sell the food to restaurants. We are employing some of these people deconstructing houses. About 22% of our waste comes from construction and demolition. So we're now taking a house that we would tear down and it would all go to the landfill, and we are taking it apart, piece by piece. And we're employing people who are difficult to get jobs to do this. The, our, in our pilot project, we were able to divert 93% of the material from the landfill and reuse it or repurpose it in some way and create jobs. This is one of my favorite things, United We Can. This is a facility that was started by people who collect cans, which have a deposit on them, and return them for money, for their incomes. We call them binners, they're street people. They have shopping carts, and they, they, they go through garbage and they pick up the cans. They take an enormous amount of waste out of the waste stream and they make a living doing it. And they finally open their own can depot and call it United We Can. This directly employs 120 people off the streets and it supports over 700 binners. Over 60,000 bottles per day are diverted from the landfill through these jobs that they created for themselves. They're a wonderful organization. And we have companies like Shift. This is a new company. We gave them a small city grant and they started a company where they're doing delivery services using bicycles. Not just a courier, but delivering groceries and construction goods and all kinds of things on cargo bikes. They now uh, have finished their grant and they are surviving and thriving and employing new people every year. 
Another one of the things from the greenest city that makes us a very livable city is activating community. And one of the things I love to talk about, we talked a lot about this with the park this week, is how to get people to talk to each other. How do we get people to interact with strangers? How do we get them to spend time in the public realm? You have to make the public realm really fun. So we're doing a lot of things that shut down streets and use that public space for people instead of cars. We have car-free days where we take some of our busiest streets and we shut them down for a day and this is what happens. This is Main Street, which is one of our busiest thoroughfares. We shut it down and it just filled with people. Car-free days was a citywide event that happened two days ago and I don't have the numbers yet, but there were, I believe, nine different streets that were shut down this year. It's, we do more every year. The local businesses who complained a lot about this actually now support it completely. And they put the booths out and they actually organize them themselves now. The city has handed it over to the local businesses who now run their, their own car-free days because they've discovered that people walking instead of driving is good for business. I love this one too. Uh, this is one of our major downtown squares. It is an extremely busy traffic and transit route. And we now shut it down every summer. We may eventually shut it down permanently. But one of the things that really works in this space is that each year we commission someone to do a piece of interactive art. This is called Picnerbia. I love Picnerbia. So it's a flowing beach-like setting with beach umbrellas with bright orange shag carpet that looks like macaroni and cheese. <laughs> and, uh, and people sit on it. And it was, it was, people slept on it at night. <laughs> people sat on it all day and they talked to strangers and they met each other. We love this one. Another thing that gets people talking is public art. This is a piece, uh, it's an orca, a whale. And it was in a part of the city that even though it's beautiful with all these wonderful views, no one really went to it. It was between two big parts of the convention center. And so unless you were a tourist there for a convention on your coffee break, most local people didn't go there. So we put great public art down there and now a lot of people go down there. Now here's a little story about Vancouver. Uh, last week, uh, while I was in a, midi, a meeting debating coal export, whether we <laughs> we're going to continue to export coal out of our harbors, this is what was happening right outside this, uh, this part of the city. Real orcas. <laughs> Eight of them. A pod came through and hung out for about an hour. That's Stanley Park. That's downtown Vancouver right there. This is life imitating art. This is another piece of public art that really gets people talking. It's called Amazing Laughter. These statues are about 20 feet tall. And this photographer must have been in that park very, very early in the morning because most of the time there are people posing next to these, doing the poses, and there are kids hanging from the arms and climbing all over them. This is a very, very popular piece of public art. Another really cool thing about this piece of public art is that it was a, a temporary piece that was brought in through a temporary art program. And one of our biggest philanthropists in the city, a fellow who started the company Lululemon, which some of you may know, the expensive yoga pants, uh, he bought it and donated it back to the city, so it's now permanent. Another great way to get people talking to each other out in the public is food. And we've already talked about how much we love food in Vancouver. A few years ago, um, we started a food cart program. We already had hot dogs. But we started to, to expand our food cart program and to encourage local food, sustainable food, and the multi-ethnic food that represents the city. And just so you know, English is now the second language in the city. Other languages from other parts of the world over are, are, are the majority of the uh, people in the city speak other languages and English is their first language. So this is Vikram Vij, and he opened a food cart. And I chose Vic, uh, Vikram for this because he's one of the city's top chefs. He owns two restaurants. He's written up in the New York Times. He's extremely big, extremely popular, and extremely good. And he opened a food cart because he saw that there was an opportunity to take his food to a whole new audience by having this available on the streets. And what happens when you get food carts is that people stand in line to wait for their lunch, and they talk to each other. People don't talk to each other in restaurants. They talk to each other at food cart lineups. And when you put a whole bunch of food carts together, that's what happens. So uh, that was a parking lot. It's no longer used for cars. It's now used for food and conversation. 
and long tables where people meet each other. So those are some of the big pieces of policy that I think help make Vancouver a very livable city. We have other policies I won't go into, there's no time for that, but I could take questions if you want. We talk about affordable housing, and uh, affordability is very challenging in Vancouver. Sorry, I have to slow down for translation. <laughs> we, when we talk about affordable, we're not just talking subsidized for low income, we're talking the entire spectrum. And one of the biggest challenges for Vancouver which is the second most expensive city in the world, second to Hong Kong, we're always in the top three or four, woohoo, um, is that uh, getting middle income people a place to live that are not poor enough for subsidization and can't afford full market housing in this very expensive city. So we do a lot of work with developers to um, encourage them to build rental housing and middle income housing and we have to forgive them some of the charges and, f and fees because there's no profit in building those things because the land is so expensive. The Mental Health Task Force. Uh, the vast majority of our policing costs goes to people with mental health issues. And we need to address that. And our provincial and federal governments are dropping the ball. So as a city, we're trying to come up with a plan to help address mental health issues. Cultural strategy. That's public art. It's grants. We give out $10.2 million a year in money to artists and arts organizations. That's one of the highest levels per capita in North America. And a digital strategy, which started with an open data um, platform. I think probably many of you here know that, but uh, what open data is, but it basically means that not only our data is available, but all the code that's behind it. And we welcome people to take the data that we have used taxpayers' dollars to collect and generate and do anything they want to. And we recently put up some data about bike, where bike racks are, and within six hours, there were two apps developed for it by independent people. Healthy city strategy. We tend to be very healthy. I think you are in Moscow as well. We bike, we ski, we, we like to play outside. And over 20 citizen advisory committees on everything from seniors to food, heritage, all kinds of issues. So I'll, I'll finish up with a case study of how these policies have come together in one neighborhood. This is that Olympic Village that I mentioned to you. It's in a place called False Creek, which is just by downtown. It used to be industrial. And here's what it looks like now. This was where the Olympic athletes lived. This is an extremely green neighborhood. I'll point out the piece of public art here. You see the giant sparrows. You can see the scale of the people next to them. We love these. They terrify children. It's, I love it. <laughs> it's fun. Actually, they terrify the parents more than the children. But it's actually a symbol. Those large sparrows are a symbol for the fact that those type of birds are actually an invasive species in Vancouver. They're European sparrows, and they have displaced many of our songbirds. So the artist uses this size to symbolize their impact. So this is a LEED Platinum neighborhood, and it has been certified as a neighborhood which is, uh, which is LEED. And we have our first net zero building in Canada in this neighborhood, which is also a low-income housing project. It's a beautiful neighborhood. Infrastructure. Lots of room for bikes, lots of room for pedestrians. The streets are very, very narrow, and there's not very much parking. The public realm was the most robust part of the of the plan here. This is a stormwater filtration channel and has grown a great deal since this photograph was taken. It's actually quite heavily vegetated now and uh, as of about two months ago, a beaver lives there. Very exciting. It's our national animal. We like the beaver. And we built a habitat island just offshore in this same neighborhood. This, this was built, it was engineered specifically for uh, wildlife so that the size of the substrate, the angle of the slope, the, the types of trees that are put there were all engineered. As soon as those fake trees went up, dead trees, an eagle landed on the top of one. They knew exactly what they were for. And we now have herring, one of the fish you have here in Russia as well, 
uh, spawning on the gravel, which is what it was designed for. They started spawning here about two years ago, and this channel was too dirty for anything to live in it 10 years ago. And now we have herons, herring spawning there, and we had a gray whale come in uh, and hang out for about a week in the city last year, the year before, um, because there was lots of groceries for him there. He hung out and snacked off this island. And there it is. There's our livable city. Looks very much like Moscow did today, with people sitting outside in a very green neighborhood next to a lead platinum community center, having their lunch overlooking clean water and the very dense residential and working places downtown in the background and their mountains. So that's my, my examples of why Vancouver is a very livable city, and I hope to see you there soon. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, really happy to have joined you. Uh, Heather and I have been here for a few days. Our experience working with Strelka has been outstanding. So you've given us a very warm welcome. So I'm going to be um, speaking about uh, a number of issues and, and uh, uh, I'm going to try to, I may skip over a couple of slides because I don't want to overlap and say again something that's already been said. Uh, we're here and uh, this is where we are, 11 hours away uh, from Moscow is the city of Vancouver and the region of Vancouver. So this is uh, the uh, region we're talking about. Vancouver is one city. It's the center of the uh, Metro Vancouver region, but there's 21 municipalities, 21 suburbs, and the entire region functions as one entity. It is uh, very much the roads are uh, interconnected, the planning, is interconnected, and I'll talk about the planning uh, a little later. Uh, this is uh, the distribution of population in Canada. So if Metro Vancouver was one of our provinces, and you may have uh, learned about some of the provinces across Canada, Ontario, Quebec, British Columbia, Alberta, and then Metro Vancouver would be the fifth largest province, and there's a number of other provinces. So Metro Vancouver at 2.5 million is a big piece of uh, Canada. This is another uh, way to illustrate that. Uh, and it is very much a reflection of how people are increasingly moving to urban areas. And this is worldwide. It's happening in Russia, it's happening in China, it's happening in Canada as well. So cities are becoming very important. Cities are becoming uh, major centers. Toronto is almost half of its province of uh, Ontario. Montreal is almost half of the entire province. So there's Montreal and the rest of Quebec, almost the same size. Uh, you have uh, British Columbia. Uh, the Metro Vancouver region is larger than the rest of British Columbia and then the other cities. Um, the Metro Vancouver region is less than 1% of the surface, the area of British Columbia, but it is 52% uh, of the population, so more than half of the population, and 54% of the GDP. GDP is gross domestic product, and I think uh, uh, it's uh, a, a very common way of measuring the, uh, the wealth uh, and the economic productivity of a, a, an area. Uh, one of the things that's happening in Canada as well as elsewhere in the world, our population is aging very rapidly and uh, this is putting pressure on the economy in a number of ways. Now, we obviously uh, heard about the City of Vancouver plans and, and their policies. There's a plan for the entire region as well, which is basically tying together the urban development, the urban growth plans of all the communities, the 21 municipalities in the region. The region is, uh, has grown very rapidly, grown to 2.3 million people. Uh, and actually, this is 2011. Today, it's 2.5 million. And uh, we're expecting by 2041 to grow by another 1.1 million. So 
uh, Metro Vancouver is going to have uh, 3.5, 3.6 million people. Now, when you look at this, these numbers, you have to say, well, you know, we need to create some jobs to make sure people are employed, and that's 600,000 jobs that would have to be created to keep the economy going. And I, uh, hearing that uh, the target of one of the cities, uh, the city of Vancouver, is to create many of those to be green jobs uh, is uh, really a, a good sign uh, that I, I really appreciate. The uh, regional growth strategy, the document, the planning document that uh, uh, basically brings together all these communities, the approval process is that every one of those communities has to vote, so their council has to vote, and the whole thing has to be unanimous. So the plan has to meet the expectations of 21 municipal councils uh, with uh, elected officials in each of those communities. So you have to spend a lot of time to build a consensus around the plan to make sure that it gets approved in that process. So what's in that plan? Well, the, uh, the black line here is the urban containment boundary and the plan has uh, policies in it that prevent development outside of the urban containment boundary. And this is how uh, if you want to achieve sustainable uh, development, you have to limit the sprawl. You have to prevent development from just taking place uh, and uh, having ever-expanding suburbs. So outside of that is uh, conservation and recreation areas. They tend to be forested area, hillsides that would be too hard to develop. Then there's uh, agricultural land. Agricultural land is uh, very tightly protected uh, by policies at the provincial level as well as uh, by the regional growth strategy. And then you have uh, some rural lands that are developable but that would be outside of the urban containment boundary. So you're restricting all the development within uh, an urban area. And this line is physically very visible. When you drive in the region, you come to where the line is, and it's very clear that there's development, urbanization on one side, and no development or very limited development on the other side of that line. Uh, general urban is the, uh, the area in gray, and that leaves uh, not a whole lot. Within the general urban area, there's almost no policies at the regional level. What the region says to municipalities is within those uh, gray areas, within the uh, general urban, the sky is the limit. You can develop uh, whatever uh, and however you wish. There's uh, two recognized uh, metro centers. And if you look at uh, municipalities like uh, St. Paul, Minneapolis, there's a lot of dual center uh, metropolis uh, that are uh, being developed uh, around the world and that's part of the plan. So the city of Vancouver is uh, the main center, it's the, uh, the name for the region, but there's also a community south of the Fraser called Surrey where they, uh, there's going to be a second city center for, or second major center for the region. The uh, Surrey Metro is investing heavily in uh, amenities that are of a regional size. So they're investing in uh, large infrastructure. Uh, then there's uh, the next level is uh, regional city centers, and those are uh, areas of uh, concentration. And this is what they would look like, not quite as dense as uh, the city of Vancouver, but uh, still pushing the density. Uh, the next is uh, the next level is the uh, small circles, and in a moment I'm going to be talking about Port Moody, which is the uh, the, the one that's uh, at the uh, near the top. The uh, again we're uh, uh, pushing density in those areas and trying to develop them as uh, as best as we can. And along the transit corridors, that are between those urban cores, there's going to be policies in place, set in place by the municipalities to uh, urbanize with more density so that uh, when the region invests uh, taxpayers' money into buses and, and 
subways and elevated uh, rapid transit, that there's going to be the density to capitalize on that investment, that many people are going to be riding those um, uh, subways and, and uh, SkyTrain. Now I'll talk a bit about the uh, city of Port Moody. Port Moody, uh, uh, a little bit over a decade ago, was developing as a typical suburb. Uh, sprawling subdivisions, single-family homes uh, that were climbing up the uh, side of the mountain. So this kind of uh, subdivision, uh, very large uh, consumption of land, inefficient in terms of service, very difficult to uh, service with buses, and uh, in, in terms of the cost of housing, not that prohibitive, but in terms of sustainability, very expensive on the environment. The uh, ecological footprint of housing like this is very large. So there, there was a referendum, uh, a plan was put in place, uh, and a referendum where uh, members of the, uh, all the residents voted on moving the density. So instead of developing this area into more of the same, more single family subdivision, it was decided to dedicate this land as park and to focus the growth into one area where rapid transit was supposed to be. So that's the red circle that I showed as part of the plan. So to focus the growth in that area. And the kind of density that's been built is uh, moving that community toward uh, being a very complete community with uh, high density residential development as well as shopping and uh, office jobs, as well as uh, business parks. So all the components that would allow people to live, work, and uh, shop and recreate within that community. So not only having more dense housing, which is uh, a, a smaller ecological footprint, but making sure that those people have the opportunity to avoid having to travel long distance to work and uh, live closer to home. So uh, how did that uh, 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 come into play? Well, we moved the community within a decade from having two-thirds single-family housing to having uh, only one-third single-family housing. And then that density, all the new growth, has gone into multifamily, into apartments. And so we've completely shifted the fabric of the city. And uh, that has been done with uh, uh, very good quality plans being put in place. And uh, people were, uh, uh, who are moving into those areas are, are very satisfied. Now, there's a lot of focus on cars. And, and today, as part of the... Uh, uh, the plan for the park across the, uh, the river, uh, we talked about the fact that uh, perhaps there would be some wisdom in removing some lanes of traffic uh, on, the, uh, on the embankment and uh, lowering the, uh, number of, uh, the, the number of lanes and, and reducing the capacity. And certainly it's been, it's been seen, it's been received uh, uh, as something that would be uh, very difficult, if not impossible, to do. And I think we've seen some numbers in our communities that show that uh, not only it's, it's possible, but it's very beneficial to uh, contain the growth of the cars. People think that uh, they can outsmart the, uh, the, the traffic congestion, that they can change the timing, they can change the route, they can uh, uh, use an app like this, that they can somehow beat the traffic. What people have to understand is that when they leave their home, they are traffic. They are part of the traffic. So you can't beat it if you're joining it. You, you just simply cannot beat it. And I think it's really important that growth not be car-oriented. In this day and age, when you look at the impact of uh, climate change on the planet and you look at the, uh, uh, the fact that uh, we're on a course, a collision course, with uh, an eventual shortage of fuel, 
that uh, we have to look at developing our cities in a different way and sharing cars and doing, uh, putting in place some of the policies that are uh, being put by the city of Vancouver. This kind of growth is, um, has hit a plateau in North America and we are seeing um, a lot of the, uh, the communities taking the same approach as Vancouver has been taking for a number of years, which is shifting to infill in the higher density living. So uh, we're talking about a balancing act between transportation, land use, and uh, the economy. And I think all those three things are very much intertwined that uh, if you make smart, smart decisions on transportation, uh, you're going to find yourself, if you can take somebody out of a two hour a day commute and all of a sudden they can commute to work by walking 10 minutes, you're increasing people's productivity. You're ending up with employees who at five o'clock on Friday afternoon are not uh, rushing to go back home because all of a sudden their quality of life has improved. The economy, the land use, and the transportation are all connected, and you have to make smart decisions in all three areas. Um, so our regional growth challenges are uh, to put more people on less land. So we're constricting, containing the land, uh, creating more jobs, but less driving. And we saw the stats from Vancouver. They've managed to create more jobs, a lot more jobs, and uh, end up with less driving, protecting green space and, and the environment, protecting industrial land, I'll talk about that in a moment, and improving air quality by having fewer trips and fewer greenhouse gas uh, productions. And uh, the integration of land use and transportation uh, are, are key to all of this. Um, I'll, I'll give you a brief case study because you can read about this uh, intensification of density for urban uh, areas and the creation of complete communities. There's lots of literature about that. But uh, when we passed, uh, after we uh, adopted the regional growth strategy within Metro Vancouver, we started to look at, okay, where else can we increase the density? And industry is uh, what I'm going to show, you're not going to find anything in literature church, uh, searches. If you search on Google, uh, you're going to find articles about uh, what we've done and uh, very, very few. So there's a limited amount of industrial land. Uh, this is something that many cities around the world are facing, that uh, all the industrial land has been uh, developed and, and the uh, new industrial land is very difficult to uh, find. This shows the industrial land within Metro Vancouver. In blue is what's developed. This line here is the total land available, and there's a little triangle of land that's vacant, land that's left over. And that triangle is diminishing very rapidly. By 2022, 2024, we wouldn't have any of industrial land left. So uh, densification is uh, something we started to talk about. This is the, um, an image that shows uh, industrial development, very wasteful use of land, lots of surface stor storage. In the areas where there's been new, um, new modern industrial parks created, it's also very wasteful in terms of the amount of paved surface, the large amount of uh, uh, land that's being used just for truck movement, and then no use of the airspace above the, uh, the buildings. So we, uh, we did uh, some calculations. Uh, that, that curve of how the industrial land is being depleted uh, could be adjusted if we adjust by only uh, 10%. Of, uh, so we create on each building, we add uh, one-tenth of the surface of that building, uh, we add uh, an extra floor, then we would save 400 acres. And um, if we were to manage to put one floor over each square foot of uh, square meter of building, we could save uh, 2,000 acres. So the impact of uh, intensifying the, the use of the land is, is great. 
traditionally, there's a lot of industrial building that have been built uh, in large multi-story structures, but in, in the last uh, few decades, the vast majority of industrial buildings has been a single story, just flat structures, warehouses that have been built. There's a number of examples around the world that uh, we found of buildings that uh, uh, are using that kind of density. And this one is quite interesting. It's, a, it's not the typical warehouse. It has uh, three floors. It has parking on the roof. And I think uh, as we talk, start talking about increasing the density uh, and reducing our consumption of land in our city and leaving land available for agricultural use and those uh, other types of uses and parks, uh, we need to look at every aspect of density, including uh, industrial. So this is another building. It's a, a tr water treatment plant, and uh, it looks like a sports field, but in fact, it's a multi-story building, and it has, uh, this is in New York City, it has not only a sports field on the roof, but it also has buildings on top of the, uh, uh, so this structure is above the uh, the. the the, the, the plant, uh, which is the kind of thinking that we have to start to adopt. And this is a, a project that's being proposed right now in the city of Vancouver, a multi-story industrial building. Uh, and the upper floor uh, at the very top is uh, there's two floors of office space. So let's not look at our industrial parks as solely industrial parks. Let's look at them as uh, uh, with the potential of development. Now, um, show of hands, uh, I have another short presentation about parks, which I think is uh, a bit unique. Um, who wants me to continue or who wants me to stop? Okay, uh, that, that, that looks pretty good. So, uh, this is about what is a park. There's a big park development that's being proposed here and there's going to be competitions. And what do you think? Is this a park? Does this kind of look like a park? Yeah, there's a play cage. Um, how about this? This is the image that a lot of people have about parks. You know, very manicured gardens. And this one is a, a park uh, just uh, uh, in BC. It's, uh, in fact, a commercial park, so people have to pay to go there. So a park, in my view, is a public space. You shouldn't have to go uh, to pay to, uh, to go to it. Now, is this a park? This is really the, the main function of a park. Putting people back in touch with nature, having nature touch you and move you. This is uh, the best way to train tomorrow's environmental activists, to train the, the kids who are going to grow to respect the environment and who are going to be helping to protect it. Is this a park? Well, it's a bit small, but uh, you know, it's green space. And uh, in some cases, that, that's what uh, is utilized. Uh, this is the smallest park ever occupied and ever, smallest park ever surrounded by police as well. Uh, this is Canada's largest park. That piece of land, that park, is Wood Buffalo National Park. It's larger than Denmark and larger than the Netherlands. Uh, a very large chunk of land. Um, and these types of parks, statistics show that uh, the family road trip, certainly in North America, I don't know about uh, in this part of the world, but in North America, uh, putting the, the kids in the car, on Saturday and taking a long family road trip, that's not part of the lifestyle anymore. People can't afford the fuel, they can't afford to do that, and uh, it's, uh, those national parks are great and we need to keep it. They're a treasure, we need to protect those parks. But we uh, also need to um, look at the fact that uh, people are not using them as much. This is, um, Somehow the presentation is on automatic now. This is um, the uh, experience of Fraser, 200 and, uh, or 550 kilometers of trail on both sides of the Fraser River. And uh, just a, a fantastic project to bring 
park space close to where people live. It's basically going to be spanning from uh, a municipality about uh, 110 kilometers from Vancouver, Hope, all the way to the water with uh, trails that are going to be on, on both sides and, and touching uh, major areas of population. The, uh, this park is a collection of a large number of parks that are uh, being uh, planned by various municipalities along the way. And there's different land ownership and management of all the pieces of it. Uh, very difficult to connect uh, those pieces in some areas, but very important to do so as well, to make people appreciate uh, this, this part of the region. Uh, along the way, there's uh, a large number of activities uh, and, and sites that are going to be uh, available for people, and some of them already exist. And the project is basically to connect the dots, to connect all these pieces together. And not only to connect them together, but also to connect them to uh, some of the, uh, the major trails and some, some of those trails are actually going into uh, the United States. So it's a, a very vast uh, uh, project, but one of those projects that, are, that, that is going to create one of the greatest uh, trails in the world. Now, along the way, there's a lot of bridges. And uh, what, what we figured uh, quite early in this project is that people are... Uh, some people are going to want to do the whole 550 kilometers and they're going to take a week to do it, but most people are going to use these trails for uh, a, quick, uh, a, a quick loop on one day in the weekend, which makes uh, the importance of bridges uh, come to the front. Bridges uh, that have been uh, converted into trails are uh, quite... Uh, numerous. There's a, a large number of those trails that have been created. And there's something really photogenic about uh, people and bridges. When you've got uh, a massive number of people on the bridge, uh, and and it's it's probably the views that you get from those bridges that is attracting people. Uh, but if you um, if you look at this image, it takes a bit of squinting to realize that there's grass on the bridge. So converting these large pieces of in infrastructure, this is the ultimate recycling. Talk about recycling a pop can. If you recycle a bridge, you know, you're, you're doing uh, really good for the environment. Uh, this is the High Line in New York City. It spans about 20 blocks. So you climb on this old uh, overpass, and it used to be a rail line. And you can basically, you're above the traffic, and you float above the... Uh, uh, the, the traffic of New York City. Uh, upon opening, this became a, an, a really overcrowded park. It is extremely popular asset within uh, New York City. The, um, uh, the city of San Francisco, actually it's the uh, state of California, is calling for proposals for the reuse of the old Bay Bridge. So they are building a new bridge. It's uh, uh, about uh, three quarters of the way done now, and uh, they are calling for proposals to uh, uh, repurpose the old one. This is um, a, another bridge that's been converted for a trail. Now this is so popular that they're now proposing to build an elevator that's going to bring people 20 stories down from the bridge deck to the water, so that you, that you can enjoy the viewpoint, but also have the ability to go down and look at the, uh, uh, touch the water. This is a bridge as public art in, the, um, in Amsterdam, a fantastic site. And uh, obviously it's used as a pedestrian walkway and very attractive part of the park system. And then you have uh, bridges being used not only as uh, a part of the park system, and as pedestrian walkways, but this one has, this is in Winnipeg, Canada, and it has a restaurant on it, so a very popular place for people to go. And this is a proposal for the construction of a bridge garden in London. So the, uh, it's, uh, I don't think the, the funding is available, but the idea is being floated around right now to develop this bridge. And what I really like about this is that they uh, obviously over 
the, the peer uh, is uh, you have the ability to uh, have more weight because that's where the column is. So the vegetation reflects the structure. So there's more taller trees because of the root ball above the columns, and then it uh, becomes shrubs where uh, the, uh, the structure is going to be more impacted by the weight of the dirt. So very smart way to uh, design. And um, I think uh, to summarize my presentation, single family housing is dead. I, I truly believe in density and I think uh, a number of plans around the world in major cities reflect that. Uh, there's going to be 9 billion people by 2050 on this planet. And whether we want it or not, we're going to end up with tall and dense cities, tall and dense urban areas. Uh, there's a, a really good book by Richard Louvre about the nature deficit disorder that uh, people who are uh, growing up, kids who are growing up without access to nature, without the ability to go to a park, nearby and touch nature are, are uh, developing a number of uh, uh, deficits as part of their personality. And we need to bring nature closer to uh, where people live, which is a challenge to grow more density and bring nature within that density. But we saw examples um, uh, in the first presentation of bringing farming in the middle of a city as well as uh, uh, developing amenities that are going to allow people to walk to these, uh, these places very closely. We need to design transit. The engineers who sit at the, their desk planning the, the way transit is going to go always look at, oh, people live over here and they work over there, so we're going to connect those two points. We need to start talking about transit that has a park as a destination. We talked about that today, uh, about the fact that perhaps one of the metro stations should be moved closer to uh, the park that's being proposed. And then we need to engage people in those processes, not just in our parks, but in how we uh, grow our cities. I thank you very much. So at this point, uh, we're going to entertain questions. If I get a question that um, uh, is being asked that people like and like enough to applaud, uh, I've got a gift for a question that gets applause. Any questions? Yes. My name is Nat. Uh, I'm really happy to see you in the team of uh, Zaredi Park Competition. It's really exciting to have people like you on board. I actually got four questions. Um, I've got three questions for Heather and one question for Gaetan. Um, so can I, can I ask them all and, and sure. then? Okay, and, I'll, so and I'll lie if I don't know the answer. I, I just wanted you to tell a couple more words about uh, the strategy to re reduce the amount of packaging. Ah. This sounds really interesting and really re relevant. Also, okay. maybe, maybe I'll, I'll answer. Okay. Uh, it's called Extended Producer Responsibility. It's a provincial program, and it puts the responsibility on the person who makes the product that they have to take care of all the waste from that same product. And that is a strong incentive to reduce packaging. So that uh, one of our big drugstores, London drugstores, now accepts all the packaging back from every product, whether it's a large television or a bottle of aspirin. They sell electronics as well. And they welcome it. They put big bins out front. And because it costs them money to do that, they are now putting pressure on the people who make those products to reduce the packaging. So if you transfer the cost and you transfer the responsibility back to the producer, they start reducing the packaging. And what is the incentive for the customer to do it? Do they get a bonus if they, or we, is it like a fund system in Germany or? No, we, uh, we take great glee in feeling superior by re you know, reducing our waste. It's a, it's, a, it's a very popular thing to be very proud of yourself for being green in the Vancouver area. All right, and um, my second question is, uh, what is your perfect balance between programming, for example, public spaces, and determining a very exact uh, program for them, uh, and plan it, 
and make sure it happens the way you planned it, and leaving some spaces unprogrammed for spontaneous activity. I mean, what's your recipe? I, I don't have a recipe. I think it depends on the space. So, for instance, the car-free days. We started by programming those. We had uh, our bike people out there with their funky bikes that they build that go sideways and are three stories high and things. And we had food vendors out there and we had uh, performances, fire twirling, people from Burning Man who do cool things in the street. And um, we don't program them anymore. We now just create the opportunity and we let people program it and it's an evolution over time. So I think you have to create the opportunity and create the space and program it perhaps until people start to get their own ideas and then slowly back away and let let the public own that space. But there's always need to be some programming, I think, if, especially if it's a large place like the park over here. So for a park over here, your proposal would be to program it first and then maybe let uh, the program, you know, unprogram itself and let the people take over or... Yeah, I suspect there'll be some programming, I would hope, and again, we're not designing it, we're, gonna, we're the jury, but we would hope that there'll be some areas that are places of respite where people can go for... Uh, rest from the sounds and the busyness of this very big, very urban metropolis of Moscow. But there also need to be places that are animated and that are really exciting. They're loud and fun and you can play. Uh, places for concerts and festivals which would need to be programmed. So I think it will need a mix of all of those things. But one of the things that we discussed today is that you want to have the form follow the function. So we want to think about what function you want this park to serve for young people, for older people, for visitors, for residents, and then let the form follow that function instead of creating a beautiful thing and hoping somebody shows up. It sounds really good. My last question to you is just something that caught my attention when you mentioned the health, uh, mental health issues. And uh, the question is, um, is, uh, is there like a larger frequency of such cases in Vancouver or are you just more advanced and more sensitive to those issues and addressing them in comparison to comparable cities of comparable scale? I don't think we have more, but um, what we do have, uh, because we're a port city, is that there are a fair number of drugs in the city. And what we have a lot of is dual diagnosis, which is people with mental health issues and an addiction of some sort. And we don't always know which came first. And those people spiral downward very quickly and become very expensive. And here's a statistic for you, for those of you who like stats like me, because I'm a nerd. Um, if you have a person living on the street and they're dual diagnosis and they're living in chaos, a state of chaos, and they're, they're, they're doing minor crimes. We have a very safe city, but they're, they're doing pop property theft to serve their habit. And they're, they're going into to fits of, of uh, mania. They end up in shelters. They end up using police resources. They end up using rescue services and emergency services. And that costs about $57,000 a year per street person. If you take that same person and you put them in housing and you feed them and you give them treatment for both their, their drug use and for their mental illness, it costs about $32,000 a year. So it's all about the money. Well, it's I'm much cheaper kidding. to house them. And unfortunately, we need the senior levels of government to do that with us. And they're not, they're not at the table. So we're doing as much as we can by ourselves. Thank you very much. And I also got a, a question to Mr. Royer. Is and let's see right if you way? get applause. <laughs> I, no, I think it's all right. Uh, it, you, also, you also mentioned uh, the consensus or uh, the way the public is involved in taking important decisions about the territorial development of their surrounding. So my question is, uh, did you do something or did the authorities do something to increase the level of let's say, intelligence or concern of people with their own environment? Were there some programs to edu educate the citizens? And how, uh, how generally is the communication system organized, the information system, and how do people know about certain decisions, when they learn about them, how are they being involved in the process, and how do you deliver the information to them? Yeah. Was that question good enough for applause? I, 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 I think she deserved a copy of my book. Uh, this is four questions. They were all good. It's called uh, Time for Cities. Um, Thank you. After I, I read it, I will donate it to the Library of Strelka so that everyone can read it. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Um, 
public consultation is uh, something you you have to grow um, uh, over time. It it takes uh, practice for people to trust that you're going to be listening to them. Uh, it's very important. You get better decisions. Uh, there's no question that uh, you've got a lot of smart people working for the government. Um, but you've got a lot of experts working for the government. I, I remember my uh, one of my first uh, uh, first projects that I, I did public consultation for a municipality it was a, uh, a a youth park, a skateboard park, and it had an inline loop and a number of things, and a little basketball court. And uh, we had this public information session. And I, I thought I was real smart, and we had programmed this really well. And uh, this young person comes to me and is looking at drawings and, and saying, OK, so this is the entrance to the park and the trail? And I said, yes. And uh, he said, well, but the bus stop is way over there. So why didn't you put a park through the, uh, the, the, the forested area so that you know, we can go to the bus? And I thought, wow, <laughs> this, is, this is worth my time. I'm not expert at everything, and I'm certainly not uh, able to think about all the different eventualities. And, and you get better decisions if there's more people involved than if you sit at the desk and you make the decisions and the policies by yourself. So uh, your question had to do with education uh, of the uh, electorate. Well, I happen to believe that people are really smart. And um, if you provide them with a, a little bit of information, they will uh, get involved. If you open the door, they will get involved. Uh, but I, I think it's really important to share uh, a lot of the uh, the information that's available to the people who are making the decisions. When uh, Councillor Deal talked about the open data, the fact that every document, uh, all the databases in the city are made available to the public. If you go to a website uh, of a municipality, as you go to Port Moody's website, there's a, a ton of information that's available, that's made, made available to the public. So people do their own research. Uh, in our community, we have uh, biologists and scientists who live there, and um, parks managers are, are pretty good at what they do, but when you've got somebody who wrote a doctorate degree uh, thesis on riparian areas, they know an awful lot about how to deal with riparian areas of a creek in a park. And uh, you have to approach public consultation from the principle of, I want to learn from the public, and I want to make the best decision for the public. So if they have something to contribute, I want to hear it. Uh, one of the, uh, the best ways to build trust in public consultation is to start with a blank sheet, to, uh, to go to the public, not when you have a project uh, almost finalized and uh, you present the drawings and you say, do you like it? Because at that time, you've spent a lot of money, you've done all this work, you've got consultants who have produced the drawings, and, and now you're in the mode of present, here's the drawings, and they look all nice, and defend. Uh, what do you mean you want us to change something? You know, we can't change because of this, this, and this. So you really have to establish that trust. And the best way to do it is to start when, when you haven't drawn anything, to start asking questions. So how should, should we go about this development? I talked about the, um, the referendum for the, uh, the city of Port Moody, where the public decided to take land that was going to be developed and turn it into a park and accept that the urban area would be more dense. So they, they people over time uh, during that whole referendum debate uh, started to say, well, geez, how much density are you going to put? And to grow the, the amount of growth that we had to accommodate, which is about 15,000 people within that area, was going to be a lot of towers. So there were arguments on both sides, 
And rather than shy away, rather than, than present the information to the public, it was presented very openly. And the public was uh, debating it. Uh, they trusted the process. And when it went to a vote, the vast majority of the public supported the dedication of the park and, and the increased density in other areas. So um, I'm not sure I answered the all aspects of your question. Yes, I did. OK, great. Thank you. Next question. У нас в стране при проектировании микрорайонов все жестко регламентировано нормативными документами. Как это в Канаде происходит? Расскажите, пожалуйста, каждый раз при проектировании новых микрорайонов вы обосновываете это расчетом и строите как по расчету, или же вы ограничены какими-то рамками? Вот вы говорили про плотность населения, что вы в каких-то районах увеличиваете плотность населения, в каких-то уменьшаете. Увеличиваете вы ее до какого-то показателя, или вы теоретически можете увеличивать ее до бесконечности, обосновав это расчетом в каждом конкретном случае? Спасибо. In our zoning bylaws, which are city bylaws, we have uh, density guidelines and density limits. And we are, we are breaking our own rules all the time. So we have what's called a public hearing every time we change the density on a site. And uh, we are up zoning the city very rapidly uh, under our own powers, our own controls. But we do go to the public. So for instance, there's a shopping mall in the city. We don't have very much in shopping malls, but there's one in the city that's a Gaetan actually pointed out. Um, and it has a very small residential development next to it. This week, we put in a new policy, and we are going to allow up to 45-story towers on the site, up to 16 towers, uh, the tallest of which could be 45 stories tall. That's a huge increase in density. That number was come to through deliberations and negotiations between the developer, the landowner, and our city planners. They do the negotiations at the staff level. They bring a proposal to us. We get yelled at by the public and then make a decision. <laughs> and that was not a very popular one, but only for the people very close to it. For the rest of the city, it made a lot of sense. And so sometimes we make a decision that's not always popular because we think it's the right thing for the city. On a smaller scale, we're taking our single family neighborhoods and we did a citywide policy. Not one site, but the whole citywide was rezoned so that you could add a small house in the backyard. We call them laneway housing. And also so that you can add a basement suite. And then so that you can add a second basement suite. So through these policy changes, which are citywide, we haven't said exactly what the density is in those sites, but one piece of property that used to have one house and, and, a, and a parking garage for the two cars now can have four separate residences on it. So those are the kinds of the policy changes that we make. Добрый вечер. Меня зовут Роман. Вот такой вопрос. Повышение плотности застройки ведет часто да, к, скажем так, перспективе к маргинализации района. К чем больше плотность населения. У нас есть такие в России понятия спальные районы, да, где за счет большой плотности населения больше количество, там, меньше стоимость жилья, соответственно, да, больше преступность, больше, вот, как вы говорите, наркотики и так далее. Плюс опыт разных стран показывает, что, как правило, вот в таких многоквартальных образуются различные гетто, национальные, культурные, религиозные, что также ведет к повышению криминальной среды. Вот существует ли при планировании повышения плотности застройки какие-то, закладываются ли какие-то механизмы, позволяющие вот обосуществлять коммуникацию, предотвращать маргинализацию людей, проживающих вот в этом плотной застройке. Да? То есть, по крайней мере, в России один дом себе, вот дом на одного человека могут позволить в основном либо жители провинции, либо достаточно богатые люди. Да? Менее богатые люди живут в многоэтажных домах. Да? Чем дальше от центра города, тем дешевле жилье, тем, соответственно, ситуация хуже, в том числе и криминальная. Спасибо. I think, Gaetan and I can probably share this answer. Um, two things. You asked about uh, crime and you asked about things like traffic. Uh, I'll start with traffic. I happen to have a statistic right here. In recent years in Vancouver, with policy changes to increase the density, 
and policy changes to reduce space for cars. We've had a 75% increase in the population in the downtown core, 75% increase in residential population, a 26% increase in jobs in the downtown core, and a 20% decrease in the number of cars. People are using cars less when we create more dense neighborhoods, as long as they're complete neighborhoods, which also have a school and a grocery store and a park, places to live, play, and work, a place to work nearby. So we, as we increase density, our traffic is dropping. We have many parking garages in the city now that are empty, and we're converting them into other things. In terms of crime, we find that the best answer is a mixed neighborhood, mixed income neighborhood. Uh, low income does not mean crime. And not in Vancouver, it certainly doesn't. In fact, um, low income is often one of our lowest income neighborhoods. The crime that exists there is drug sales and drug use, but uh, it, people don't get mugged walking through that neighborhood. It's a crime where the victim is the person themselves. That neighborhood is also one of the tightest communities in our city. They know each other, they protect each other, they watch out for each other very much. So it's a very, very close community of people brought together by the fact that they live in hardship. The police do not abuse them for using drugs. They go after the drug dealers. They don't go after the drug users because the drug users are the victim, not the criminal. We find it very difficult to build mixed development because of the cost of land. And it, you need to have uh, money from other sources to get subsidized housing. And the developers don't have that money. The developers want to build the high rises. And by the way, in Vancouver, those are the most expensive places in town are the penthouses on the top of those towers. Rich people live in apartments in Vancouver. It, it's over a million dollars for a one-bedroom apartment in, in some of those glass towers downtown. So um, the whole ethos of a big backyard and room for your two cars being a sign of, uh, of wealth has shifted. And now the sign of wealth is what floor of the building are you on? And I'll let uh, Gaetan talk a little bit more about the planning side, I think. Yeah, I think uh, a number of you are planners or are going to be planners uh, working uh, in various municipalities. I, I think the, um, uh, the, the lessons that I, I've learned and that I'd like to uh, pass on is that you need to build a diversity if you want to avoid the problems that uh, are, are being talked about. I suspect the areas that are uh, turning into ghettos, the areas where uh, there's going to be a lot of housing, high density housing, and a and, uh, uh, number of crimes happening, may not have shopping nearby. One of the, uh, when I was driving from the airport, uh, somebody uh, gave me a ride and I saw a bus stop on the other side of the highway and people walking over these long uh, overhead walks to go to uh, a bus stop. So there's all these towers. I didn't see any shopping. Um, and then a long walk to rapid transit. So people would, would need to have a car. There's no shopping, there's no little park nearby, so there's not going to be an opportunity to meet your neighbors and to feel secure. When I showed the photograph of the high density housing uh, with, with the snow, uh, this is a development where we looked at diversity uh, in terms of the size of businesses. So you want to make sure you have businesses of various size, a little boutiques, the, uh, the place, the convenience store, but also some larger stores, you have to look at the diversity within each building. If your building is all apartments the same size, uh, you're, gonna, you're not going to have a mix of, dense, uh, of families. You need to have apartments for seniors, for single people, for families with one kid, with two kids, so that the, the, uh, the building itself has got a small community. The building itself is a village. And within, the, uh, within that building, uh, Heather was talking about the fact that there's going to be various incomes as well. So you're going to have uh, low income, median income, and at the very top, perhaps a few apartments with higher incomes. And I, I think that kind of diversity, recreating a village, is going to combat 
the, uh, the creation of a ghetto. Uh, there's there's got to be really high quality development in terms of the quality of the experience. When people come out of the building, uh, there should be some texture, there should be some brick walls, there should be some streetscape that makes it comfortable to be there. That the space should not be like, treated like a, a warehouse in utilitarian. So investing in that streetscape is important. And um, I, I'm hoping that I'm answering your question. Uh, but the last thing I'm going to say is that uh, the most challenging job of a planner is to push the developer to provide these public amenities. A developer is going to want to do the simplest thing possible. If the market shows that uh, a two-bedroom apartment that's very tiny uh, is the, uh, the, what's going to bring them the biggest profit, they're going to build a tower with just that. So you as a planner have to say, no, I want a diversity of size of apartments. And they're going to find all kinds of reasons why they can't do it until you force them to do it and then it's going to work because you can resolve those little technical issues. They're going to want to cheapen out on the public amenities, on the, uh, the space. They're going to say, well, people who buy an apartment want the nice kitchen. They don't care about the parking entrance. So you have to care about that parking entrance and making sure that it's safe, that it feels uh, like, like a, a space that's lived in, that there's eyes, that there's windows overlooking that parking entrance. And all of those things are details that uh, are managed by the protectors of the public realm, which is typically planning staff. Other questions? У меня такой вопрос. Есть ли в Ванкувере такие специфические, может быть, документы? Ну, в России они есть. Генплан и правила землепользования и застройки. Или каким образом они функционируют, если есть? Расскажите вот что-то именно по документации и по градостроительному процессу, технологии этой. Спасибо. I, I think each municipality has um, an official community plan, so each city has a plan. The, uh, the way to uh, adopt this plan is uh, uh, typically there's going to be a lot of public consultation, a number of public meetings, uh, a very formal public hearing, which is a, a legal process at the very end, and then the council of that municipality is going to vote. The regional plan is the plan I talked about, which is a plan that, again, there's a lot of public consultation. City? Yeah, the city plan is uh, official community plan approved by council. Uh, Vancouver actually has a, a different charter that it operates under from the other cities in the province of British Columbia. Uh, there's a thing called the community charter that all other communities are operated under. We have our Vancouver charter, which is slightly different. Uh, and that is, um, that is a regulation which is given us by the province. That is a control given to us by the province. We are creatures of the province. Uh, the cities are created by the provincial government. So Vancouver charter does not require an official community plan. So we don't have that same single document that is our entire community plan. We do have our greenest city plan. We have our transportation plan. We have uh, building codes. We have all kinds of zoning bylaws. So many, many pieces. Some are very technical. Some are more aspirational. Um, we are trying to add into every plan goals, timelines, deadlines, uh, implementation plans, so that they're not just saying pretty words, so that they actually have uh, uh, targets in them that make us accountable to the plan. But like I say, some of them are very technical, they're engineering documents, transportation engineers or planning documents, and other ones like our culture strategy 
are more about um, how to ensure that we are funding public art well and things like that. So we have a menu of plans at the city level and they're all online and available and if you wanted to ask me about anyone in particular, I can get you the link. А вот хартия это что-то типа стратегического плана, то есть более обобщенного Ну, то есть он включает в себя и культурное развитие, и экономическое, и все на свете, или именно градостроительное? No, no, it actually describes the authority and the responsibility of the city in broader terms and processes that we have to do. But we, we, we create the policies, the separate policies ourselves as a city government. The Vancouver Charter just gives us the authority to make certain decisions and describes, it's a legal document. So the city then does the documents that are operational for how we operate as a city. It's a complicated system. I think we're done. As, as we're finishing, there's something I wanted to say, as well as thanking Anna and the entire institute for an amazing experience here. I want to thank our translator, because I normally speak three times as fast. I talk like this usually. <laughs> And she, she, she's, she does too. And we talked ahead of time on how to make sure I spoke slowly enough for her to translate. And she did a great job of translating. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you everybody for your patience as well, sitting through a very long presentation. Thank you very much for your talks. Thank you.